I just started recording. Okay, so I would, uh, now that we're recording, I would like to call the Finance Committee meeting uh, for the Town Finance Committee, September 8, 2023, to order at one, three minutes after one. It was posted as a one o'clock meeting. And uh, so I uh, want to note that this meeting is being held, is permitted by um, the open meeting law uh, modifications uh, as an electronic meeting. But I want to also remind anyone who is uh, participating in the meeting that this is being recorded um, and is being recorded both for audio and visual and video uh, purposes. So um, just please be aware of that. Um, let's go through the um, list of committee members and make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. And uh, so Anna. Present. Lynn. Present. Uh, please note that Bob Hegner had notified me in advance that he's unavailable for this meeting. Uh, Bob, or Matt, let's see, you're Matt. Here. Present. You're here, and uh, Bernie? I'm here. Kathy? Here. And uh, we will note that um, Alicia is not present for the moment, and if she comes, uh, we will um, note that for the minutes uh, when, she, when she arrives, and we'll keep an eye on the attendee list also to make sure that she doesn't come into the attendee list, gets brought into the room. So with that said, um, I think that um, we're ready to proceed with the agenda and I'm going to proceed in the order that the agenda um, was published. So the first matter is to uh, um, have public comment and um, like to remind anybody who's in the audience that they and, should. And Andy Lynn has her hand up also. Lynn, did you have something? Uh, Alicia has confirmed that she'll be joining us soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, back to public comment. Uh, anybody who's interested in public comment, please raise your hand. I have one person who has, and that's Renata Shepard. So uh, we should bring her in. And uh, we um, always welcome uh, public in comment on matters that are relevant to the Finance Committee. And um, Renata, welcome. And uh, please uh, identify yourself and uh, what district you live in, and then uh, offer your comment to the committee. Hi. Um... Renata Stafford, I live on Justice Drive. And um, I've been following this rental registration process from um, the early stages. And was actually, hopefully, you were uh, going to finally make it fair. Well, you're not. I was shocked by the numbers provided and was seriously expecting the $150 fee would be reduced to reflect more fairness in this rental registration process. And not um, a $50 discount for being local does nothing after adding inspection fees, not to mention that was quoted in the bullet saying a higher fee would not bother me. I want to express it. It really ended up yeah. bothering me. You, can, let me stop you for just a moment. Do you know why there's uh, such an echo, Athena? Because uh, okay. it sounds like there's some background noise um, in, well, from, coming from Renata's microphone. Yes, we can hear you. There's just some background noise coming through your microphone. I'm in, outside, I'm not at home, so I'm sorry. Uh, so were you able to hear me so far? Um, hearing you better now. Should Somebody. I start over? Yeah, go ahead, start over. So I said, um, I've been following this rental registration process from the early stages and was actually hopeful that you were going to finally make it fair. Um, and well, you're not. I was shocked by the numbers provided. Um, I was seriously expecting the $150 fee would be reduced to reflect more fairness in the rental registration process. Um, fairly not. The $50 discount 
uh, for being local. There's nothing after an inspection fee. Uh, not to mention, I was misquoted in the bulletin saying the higher fees do not bother me. And no one's expressed that it, it really indeed bothers me. And my profit margin does not justify the high fees. Uh, besides uh, that, the inspections are different in condos, which have common areas governed by association rules and small units rather than large homes with several bedrooms and outdoor space and the different. Uh, this is something to reduce the cost and have it share more fairly. Uh, colleges should also provide assistance since most complaints come from student parts and I do not pay for problem home. Finally, uh, capping lar uh, large properties uh, would put more burden on small landlords and will drive them out of business. Not only that, uh, but the state of Massachusetts is very protective of tenants. Uh, there's a new law that requires landlords to provide um, information sheets to tenants on how to find resources, including access to Board of Health for free inspection. Um, if they complain that their landlord is not addressing issues or the problems, then the key word is free, paid by all taxpayers. Um, anyone creating or changing rental rules must have must be very well versed uh, in state rental laws for creating more hurdles. Uh, maybe trying to rewrite state laws in layman's terms would be helpful so everyone can understand them. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for your comments, Renata. And uh, we are not likely to be making a uh, final decision today on a recommendation of the council as possible, but um, I'm not anticipating it. And uh, so if you, um, I would encourage you, uh, if you have your comments in writing, to also consider sending them uh, to me and I is it uh, my my address, uh, which is Steinberg A at AmherstMA.gov, and I will make sure that they then are conveyed on to the entire committee, including our resident members. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your comments. Uh, seeing no other comments, um, Alicia has joined us. Alicia, can you hear us? Need to confirm your. Yes, thank you, Andy. Okay, so. And I'm just uh, noting it's 112, thanks. In the minutes, we'll note your, uh, that you joined us. So thank you. And uh, we just started with public comment as the first item. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, spend a little bit of time now on Councilor compensation discussion um, as a um, first. And of course, as a reminder to what um, the sequence of events were is that the committee had recommended um, an increase to 7,500, but the council um, adopted a, um, an amount of 10,000 with an adjustment to the president's uh, additional increment as and uh, the matter that's been referred back to us is um, about funding the increase and um, there was a memorandum that was provided by former finance director Rangano and town manager Bachelman which was uh, uh, then referred on um, as part of what was referred on to the committee. Um, and uh, the other thing that um, are two other things that I will note is, is that uh, there were amount um, that the, in the discussion of the council, and let me start there, the, in the discussion of the council, there was um, a question of a third option because um, the um, memo I'm referring to, which is in the packet for this meeting, refers to two options. Uh, one is uh, um, a transfer from um, free cash when free cash transfers are made available uh, that would fund the uh, first um, 
part of the year and then until the budget uh, takes over for the second half of the year. And the second option was to delay the implementation of the increase until July 1st. The, during the council discussion, there was a third question, um, third option that was discussed. And that was to uh, fund the amount out of the uh, uh, budget so that uh, the entire compensation for the year would be paid at the new amount, but that the um, additional um, the amount above the current council compensation would not take effect until, uh, would not be available until July 1st, so that in essence, uh, the entire additional amount would be uh, conveyed during the second half of the year. So those were the three options. The other thing that I wanted to note is there was an email that I sent to the committee, which I assume will be made a part of the packet for this meeting. It may be shown on the screen at some point by me or somebody else, but um, I raised certain questions with Sean Mangano about the first option, which has to do with the uh, free cash uh, transfer anticipation and uh, uh, so those that my questions to him and his answers to me um, I shared with the entire committee so with that I want to open it up to the committee to see if the committee has any uh, questions about where we are with this process uh, Lynn thank you Andy maybe I'm not hearing things correctly but there i thought there was also another option that we discussed and that was that we, in fy 24 we would only we would receive prorated the same amount counselors would receive prorated the same amount as they presently receive, that would take us up to the beginning of July 1. And then on July 1, we would not go for the full compensation, but do some additional prorating for FY25. Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, so we don't have Sean present. Um... My understanding is, is that the, in essence, there were three options. And, it, and FY25 didn't matter because that would come out of the FY25 budget when there is such a, uh, such a budget. But the, the question is, calendar year, since the, the thought of the council was is that the when they, when they first passed the motion, the uh, increases would be effective on January 1st. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the questions were what to include in the, what to recommend to be included in the FY24 budget. Uh, I think that's, if I'm getting the, Year, so I know it would be the FY25 budget, but there were two versions of it. One was to put, uh, to not have the increase take effect until that budget goes in effect, which would be July 1st. And that was, I think, what was an option in the memo that was from Sean and Paul. In the second, which was discussed at the meeting, but was not an option in that memo, was to have the entire amount for the calendar year included in the budget, but to be, but then it couldn't be paid, and the increase couldn't be paid until July first. Uh, Kathy. Um. I was going to try to paraphrase what Lynn said, but I'm not sure it makes sense. It's, you know, if 
let me just so let me just say something a little bit different the if the full amount doesn't start till july um when it's been budgeted for in the calendar year that we're looking at people would get 7500 as i roughly compute it. The first part of the year would be at the lower level and the second part of the year would be at the higher level. And I may not be quite right in the terms of months, but if they're exactly six months, that would be right. So um, it's it's it, it's a delay to go up to the full 10, but the, the so I just wanted to say it a little bit differently on the one that doesn't do the increase until we put money in the budget. So it would, for the calendar year of 2024, people would be getting 7,500. And for the calendar year of 2025, which is out in our future zone, they would get it, be getting the full 10 um, because we would have built it into the budgets is the option of the delay. So I just want to phrase it a little bit differently because it's not that there's uh, no increase in calendar year 2024, but it's, the proposal is not to go all the way up. Um, so Lynn, I think that was where we, you know, the prorating is, you know, it it kind, kind of happens in a mush, but it's not that we've said we've prorated starting in July. It's just, if you think of what you're gonna see in your bank account, that's the way the flow of funds will look at. And if you have to file income taxes on it, that's what you're gonna be filing income taxes on, so. I'll just, that was just a, me trying to rethink what not doing it till July is. Thanks, Kathy. That's exactly capturing what I meant. Okay. Matt. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I, and maybe, maybe uh, Holly can help us with this, I or or somebody on the council, uh, on the committee. So I was just confused by Sean and Paul's memo. They talk about, a sixty-four thousand five hundred um, amount, right? That that's and then and then I'm looking at option two, which is like seems to be clearly their their preference, and uh, you know I, I certainly understand that. Um, and they talk about delay submitting an appropriation request for this added cost. And so my question kind of piggybacks on Kathy's: Are we talking about a prorated added cost to up the compensation starting in July one, or are we talking about prorating the full amount that the council is authorizing uh, by its recommendation. So in other words, is, is it the 25 or is it the five? That, I, don't, I think that's ambiguous in this in this memo. Well, if, if my explanation was clearer, Matt, I think that's what their option of the delay is, that, that you know, we would this fall put it in the budget and so there would be no doubt about that on July 2024, you're getting $10,000 stipend a year divided by the number of months, you know, and that for the first six months, you would be continuing to get what we now get. Um, we get paid biweekly. I think that's what they meant by it. So it's not trying to take on any of the added expense in the fiscal year we're living in right now, because we would have to figure out where that money comes from. There isn't there isn't an existing pot called um, discretionary money for increases in stipends. <laughs> right. And and if I can just respond, because I, I I know that's that's definitely the intent is to not take any of the burden on this fiscal year. It's just not clear to me whether the intent is to push, you know, if the council takes this action of increasing the stipend now, does that then create the obligation you know, next year and pushing the obligation. I think you understand what I'm asking. Bernie? Yeah, Andy, um, <clears throat> I'm looking looking at the memo. I, it just seems to me that uh, option two is the um, is the cleanest and most straightforward way to do this. You, know, you, you build it into the FY25 budget. The budget passes July 1, the new increased compensation goes into effect. There's no um, fiddling, if you will, with this year's budget. There's no uh, taking money out of free cash. I'm sure we'll have um, free enough free cash to do that. 
Uh, but using money out of free cash for anything vaguely resembling an operating expense usually causes some uh, some tumult. <laughs> and, and it just seems to me that the easiest way to do this, the most straightforward way to do this, is build the increase in the FY25 budget and, and go forward with that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that what we're uh, dealing with is sort of a, a problem that I don't think that the uh, Charter Commission may have uh, thought it through in exactly the way that we're dealing with this um, because the um, since the requirement is um, sort of built around creating compensation decisions for the next council term during the first 18 months of the prior council term, council terms begin on January 1, but the um, appropriation is done on a um, state fiscal year. So I think that we're um, trying to deal with that reality now. And uh, that's what uh, I don't think that um, it was uh, really anticipated because I didn't think through the mechanics of it the way that we're forced to think through it from the budget perspective. The other option that um, was discussed in the memo was the option of uh, looking at the possibility of transferring a half a year's worth of 32500 at the time that free cash transfers are met. And that was the subject of my email to Sean and um, during his last week and his responses. Uh, it looks like there's going to be um, sufficient funds. And it, just so everybody remembers that transfers occur either because there was additional revenue or um, there was a, uh, money that was appropriated that is unspent. And um, as the year progresses, um, and Holly can talk about this too, um, she will event, she will come to a conclusion that the, uh, as to what that amount is as the uh, budget for the prior fiscal year gets closed out, the one that is not, that ended on June 30th. And uh, once free cash is certified by the Department of Revenue, then um, there's the opportunity for the council to take actions with it. And the normal actions that we take are to transfer, um, to make sure that free cash remains at the amount that policy um, envisions 5%, that the general stabilization fund uh, be funded at 10% and that other money, that the rest be um, allocated as determined by the council. Um, but normally it's to try and get it into other uh, stabilization funds, including the amount for the reparation stabilization fund and to do as much as we can for the capital stabilization fund knowing that that's what we can do for um, road repairs and sidewalks, which is uh, the uh, hole that never gets filled in multiple ways. Uh, so, and, uh, but to take, to make it, uh, make a determination at that point that a portion uh, be transferred to some fund to be used for the purpose of compensation. So I think those were the, the, the points that Sean was essentially making in that, um, in his response to me. Ali, is, do you have anything else to add on that or? Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, just to sort of reiterate it, there's, you, you really have the two options of number one, appropriating it from free cash or waiting until next um, budget cycle, FY25. And I think that Kathy explained it well, the first six months would be at the lower rate. The second six months would be at the higher rate. It's not necessarily being prorated, but it would just, you know, as the 
calendar year versus fiscal year worked out, that's how it would work out. The first year would be the 7,500 and then the second year would be the full $10,000. Um, you know, the only other option, which is is really sort of not an option is to take it from your existing budget, but then you would have no money to spend on things like training and conferences um, and, you know, anything else from office supplies, et cetera. Um, so right now you're you're really looking at just either making that decision to delay it till FY25 or um, I, I do think that free cash, uh, you know, again, it's it's too early to say, but I think it will more than than um, be sufficient to keep our um, stabilization funds at the general stabilization fund at where we want and then put the additional money into the capital stabilization. Kathy? Uh, yeah, I just want to speak to option, the option that Bernie just said, he, it was his preferred option, this, the the two half years, because I think, I think it's a unfortunate term, this notion of free cash, which makes you think like we have no good use for it. <laughs> it's like discretionary spending on some way. But I think we have such a high need for delayed road, sidewalk, and other repairs. And last time, those of us who were on finance, I think all of us in this group, um, the, the extra, we put in a million dollars for roads. We We pledged up to a million for the athletic field, and that's sitting out there if they never do the field, we should take it back. Um, is one thing I would like to do. <laughs> Shouldn't just be sitting out there. And then we set up the capital stabilization fund and we we have uh, an obligation and we were talking about this a lot with the school to taxpayers to as much as possible lower future costs of the delayed infrastructure that we've got and be able to find a way in our budget. And I think that's what we've been budgeting for to build this up. So I just want to speak strongly for the um, the option that keeps it until we put it in the budget. And I also want to just say that we, um, we, we've we been very tight on the budgets um, and I was uncomfortable with, as people know, going all the way up to 10, but we're getting there here. Um, and it's, you could think of it's a slight phase in, and it's, uh, it's pretty impressive if we're gonna be able to build up the stabilization fund to be able to go, for those of you who didn't take a tour, a recent tour of DPW, um, where it's raining in on their heads um, and and it's literally raining in on their heads. Uh, and so we saw that when we went earlier and Lynn, I know you went more recently, but we've been sent pictures of, we've got a building that's in a state of collapse uh, rather than just need some prettying up. So I think we've got a real need that serves the entire town. Um, so I that's why I wanna speak to this, this second way of, of funding the increase in a stipend for uh, those of us in the legislature. So I guess at this point, uh, we could either delay it for one more meeting or if somebody makes a motion, then the motion is on the floor. Uh, but uh, if you certainly think that uh, we can't entertain a motion, Matt. Well, I just want to come back around and and make sure my question was understood because I I feel like it we kind of maybe didn't quite get uh, addressed. You know, I, I do think that if the council took a vote to increase compensation up to ten thousand, um, that that can be done without leaning on this current fiscal year's budget, but instead by and it's not a monthly, I mean, I understand that it gets paid out monthly or biweekly or whatever, but that's not that's not actually what the council set. It wasn't a monthly rate. It was a it was an annual rate. And so um I just want to make sure that folks understand. My my question was, you know, could the <clears throat> 645 be pushed into the FY25 budget? Um, and then that monthly or biweekly rate be proportionately compensated 
to hit that 10k next year and to kind of honor the the council motion that happened or the the, the that motion so i because I, I feel like we didn't quite address that and i'm not actually advocating for that or against it i just i don't hear that actual idea being discussed but Matt, when you say that do you mean in next year the next fiscal year or the next calendar year Cal implementation would start july 1 but i'm talking about the ten the calendar year as being the year that the council set compensation for can 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 i attempt to say what i think you're trying to say matt in dollar terms if the cost for a year is an additional 64000 i think you're suggesting we budget not just 64 in the next year but 64 plus 32 just for this one time catch up and then in the following fiscal year, the cost would be 64. Is that what you're suggesting so that you you get a weird way of getting paid, but you get a, a big increase? And then the only Thank thing you. is everyone would experience it as a decrease in January, 2025. <laughs> I guess yeah, I, I, we're right. I mean, that's yeah. I, I mean, just that's I exactly, think that, that's what was that's needed. What, Thank you. For that's that. what you were trying to say, right? As as a another as a way of keeping the expense up in the ninety six thousand dollar range rather than the sixty four thousand. It okay. I I th that's what I thought I heard. Yeah. Okay, so that uh, which is just uh, more artfully stated but what i was trying to say is the third option that i thought came out of the council discussion alicia your hands up uh yes thank you andy i was also going to just try to clarify what i thought matt was saying but the same thing in that we would then overall still have the 10k for the year it would just be sort of rationed differently so that it can align with the budget when we are allocating the new budget um, which i don't think is an, is a terrible idea but I'm still advocating and hoping that we can start the increase starting on January 1st, um, because while I do agree that we didn't talk about specifically monthly installments and what that number is, but essentially that is the number that families are going to need to be taking into consideration when they're making plans for childcare, for food, for all of the things that we said the increase would be for. Um, and so like, Again, if I needed to have childcare for the two meetings up front, because we do have the reimbursement, but we don't have upfront costs for those things, or if I needed to make sure my family had food for those two meetings, essentially we would have the same amount of money that we had now that we already said was not enough on a monthly basis. And so I think that starting that monthly increase in January is extremely important for incoming counselors who will be counting and assuming that that will be the case, especially for families or non-traditional families who may need the extra support in order to effectively serve on the council. Um, so I would still be advocating and hoping that there would be a way that we could have the increase effective as of January 1st or whenever the new council <clears throat> is inaugurated. Um, but I do see in terms of trying to balance budget demands um, the value in what Matt is saying in terms of considering that as opposed to just dropping it down to 75 and having a slow increase because one, that is not what the council decided. And there are very specific reasons why we determined that we think 10K, while it still wouldn't be enough, would be a more significant increase. Um, so I would be hoping that we would consider still trying to find a way to increase for January 1st. But I do think what Matt was saying would be a better idea than having it only be the 75k for the first year and increasing to 10k for the second year and of course thank you uh and then we have to get into the question if we're going to do that how we get that additional money avail made available for the second half of the current fiscal year bernie i i don't think that the Department of Revenue would appreciate the town appropriating funds in FY25 to compensate for labor in FY24. If you want to be paid in January when the new council is seated, then you need to appropriate the money now. That means taking it out of free cash, rearranging budgets, um, maybe holding off on the payment until the 
near the end of the fiscal year when we can move some money around when you know we've got some spare change here and there but um it is not a smooth move <laughs> let me put it that way to to put f to try to pay fy24 labor uh, costs in your fy25 budget i wouldn't want to do that one um uh, athena put her hand up and i'd like her to go ahead I was just going to ask Holly if she can check on that. Our charter doesn't, it doesn't call the counselor compensation pay for work done. I mean, we could pay counselors in a lump sum at the beginning of the year. So I'm wondering, Holly, if we can check to see if that's accurate, if, if the DOR would have a problem on paying with paying counselors the, the way that Bernie suggested. I, I just, you know, again, it's it it becomes an old bill. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, I understand what you're saying, and it, and that that is yeah. typically the issue with paying people from the last fiscal year. But I'm not sure if that same thing applies because of uh, you, you know the, the the fact of the matter is that the counselors get a 1099. Um, they're employed. They're okay. considered employees. Um, people have to jump through hoops with teachers' contracts to make sure the teachers can get their quote summer money in quote. Um, there's no such contractual obligation here with the with mm -hmm. the counselors. Is the point that it's unfortunate that we have uh, counselors seated on an annual basis while we run a fiscal year um, that that's basically six months out of sync. So let's be simple about this and let's be straightforward. If folks want to be compensated starting in January at the new rates, then appropriate the money, take it from free cash, and put the money in the budget. Um, if you want to be, um, if you want to be more conservative about it, and and what I think is a little bit more straightforward, I understand the free cash and I understand the whole thing. So I've been through this stuff. Um, if you want to give the appearance of being a little more straightforward, a little more fiscally conservative, then put it in, put in the new rates in the FY twenty five budget, appropriate the money there, and go forward. So you got one of two choices. <laughs> you want to spend the, you can take, we'll have, we'll have enough free cash to cover this. We're very good. If you look uh, at the record, we're very good at predicting how much free cash we have because we're pretty tight. We're pretty conservative when we, we uh, uh, form our budgets. Uh, we've lucked out in terms of some, some expenses. So there will be, you know, there, there, there will be money. Um, it, you know, so it, it's up to the council. If you want to get paid in January, appropriate the extra money now. Um, if you don't want to, if you want to wait uh, and make it look a little different, then, you know, put it in the FY25 budget. Lynn? Thank you, Andy. Um, I personally support the idea that we keep the present budget the same that in FY25, we budget so that counselors during that fiscal year would receive 10,000. Therefore, in the first year of a new council's term, they would only receive 7,500. I understand the cash flow issue with childcare. I have gone through the issue of childcare myself back in the earlier days. Uh, but we also did put in this budget, the FY24 budget, a, if you will, pilot of child care and family care funds of another half million, uh, another five thousand. Five thousand, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I knew it wasn't that high. Um, the other reason is I, there are so many demands on free cash. Everybody's lining up. And they think of it as free cash, and it's not. All it is is what's left over from last year's budget, and we have guidelines on how we have to spend that. In addition to that, I think us rushing to give this to ourselves, to give to future counselors, to give to the next council, leaves a political taste in our community that I personally do not like. Uh, I'm hearing about other compensation issues, about teachers and others where people are not happy about it. And I'd like to see us as a finance committee say, here's what is a sound decision going forward for finance. 
and do it as we've talked about and not try to rush in and take some of the precious leftover FY23 budget money. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I will say that, I mean, at our last meeting, I supported, you know, those points and I, and I did feel like 7,500 was an appropriate point to get to, but then the, the town council took its action. And, and my understanding is we are trying to figure out how to, you know, do what the council said. So, so, I mean, I, I, I think if we were going back to that debate, I would be in the same boat, but I, I think right now our task is a slightly different one. Um, so I just want to make that point. Nancy. I'm prepared to make a motion um, if we think that we're ready to take a vote, Andy. And my motion would be to uh, have the Finance Committee recommend option two and that we write a report that captures what Lynn just talked about um, and uh, talked about limiting, you know, earmarking the use of free cash on a huge uh, queue of needs and that we will be then building it into this coming budget and future budgets. So we're honoring what we voted on. Um, so I'm prepared to make a motion that we recommend option two. I don't wanna have to read the whole option out um, um, unless you don't wanna move forward with the motion at this point. I think we've all, we've all spoken actually, yeah. Are you making that motion? I, yeah, I'm willing to make the motion. I make a motion that the Finance Committee recommend option two to the council, um, which is to uh, it, you know, fund the full amount with the next fiscal year. Um, but I just want to say option two that, and then have the memo accompany it because I don't want to have to read the long explanation of what option two is. I, I got it. Thank you, Kathy. And of course, that would mean that in effect, Counselors would be receiving $7,500 for the next calendar year. Correct. And uh, that it would be moving to, to uh, in essence, in two steps to get to the full amount. The full amount can we, the next can the second calendar year. I, can we hear if there's a second before we start debate? Second. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's been been a motion that's made and seconded. Linda's a seconder and mover is uh, happy. So that's the discussion is now on the motion. And Alicia. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, so I respectfully disagree with a few things that have been mentioned, one specifically in terms of the child care compensation, I mean, uh, reimbursement, just because again, it's reimbursement, not compensation. And so in order to be able to access those funds, you need to have the money up front at first, anyhow, to be able to pay for those child care services, and then you would get the money back. And it would turn into a cycle where people who need to access these funds are then not being compensated for any work. And I know that like Athena said, this is not pay, but essentially it just puts people with children or families or other things like that on a different plane. Um, and usually those people may need the funds more than people who do not have to be in that situation. Um, so I don't think that that's fair. And going off of the council vote itself, we voted to increase it to 10 starting next year, not in the following year, which would be the last year of that council. Um, and so again, I don't think that aligns with the vote that was made by the council. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's following what we said we were going to be doing. Um, I do hear <clears throat> and understand that we have a lot of um, needs in line for the free cash. Um, and this is just another one. And I do understand the need to prioritize and understand those things. But in terms of compensation issues for like other teachers and stuff, while I I'm fully aware of the egregious pay that teachers and parents receive and that that's something that should be addressed. That's not necessarily in our purview and we don't necessarily have the ability to do that. Um, and so I think we should be focusing on the task at hand right now, which is thinking of how we can meet the vote that the council took, which was making sure that the counselors who are inaugurated in January can access the 10K that we voted that they have. Hey. We'll look to see if there's any other hands uh, for discussion on the motion that's on the floor. 
because if not, then um, I think that we should uh, proceed to a vote and uh, be asking, uh, as always, uh, whether there's support for the motion from the resident members, but we're still in discussion and I see Matt has his hand up. I apologize, Andy. Um, I just, I want to just, so somebody mentioned writing a thoughtful memo that kind of lays out some of the discussion, particularly this prorated issue that are, that's not really what it is, but call it a prorated issue, if you will. Um, and then, but when, when Kathy made the motion, you sort of made a comment about how that prorated issue was not part of the mo. So I'm, I'm, I would, I mean, I, I, I think that I would probably support option two as a motion, but I would, I would like for town staff to have that full deliberation in it. I wouldn't, if, if we're assuming that it's um, 7,500 for the year, and that's what option two means. Uh, so I just, I mean, I want to tease that out just a little bit further. I apologize, but um, just, just to be clear. You know, Matt, I, I, my, my, when I mentioned that it's, Andy has to write a report to to the council so i wanted him to make that clear in the report so it's cleaner i think just to say we're voting on option two and then in the report capture the discussion and what the implications are the other thing i would add in the report is that the we are we do have a charter commit charter review that we're setting up we could fix we could add a word or two in the charter on this discontinuation so you future future efforts to do this wouldn't hit it we could just make it clear that when it would start but that i didn't want to muddy this motion which is just a vote on this motion but i wanted the report to capture what what it means um rather than trying to write it into the motion could, could athena read the motion Kathy's motion was to recommend the council proceed with option two. So it is the motion on the floor and uh, I'm, I'm troubled by it because I have been hearing what Felicia has said and what the, um, and I don't know how many counselors um, this is gonna make them, um, major effect too, but I know that there are some, there will be some. So uh, we don't know who the voters are gonna choose as the next council. But uh, I think that the uh, one, th one thing that I'm very uncomfortable with is trying to uh, rearrange expenditures out of the current year budget so that we increase counselor compensation for the current fiscal year out of that budget, because uh, if we're going to use the council portion of the budget, then it has to come out of uh, uh, essentially training conferences. And I think that Paul um, has previously stated his concern about that. And I, and I agree with it wholeheartedly that there'll be new counselors and the counselors who continue. And I think that there's been um, known you know the benefit of uh going to the mma meeting and being involved with in doing other training and being involved with other councils around the state and learning from other councils and other communities is is valuable and uh i i think the pre-cash discussion has already been uh, covered athena just wanted to make a quick note that also included in the council's budget, that's where we pay for uh, newspaper advertisements for bylaw changes, zoning bylaw changes, and so on, as well as extra help for minute takers for council committees and to the town council. So motion's been on the floor. There's been substantial discussion and uh, seeing no further hands going up. I'm going to give about 10, and as I say this, if anybody has anything else to say, they can still raise their hand. But if not, I'm going to uh, proceed alphabetically through the list. Um, and uh, by last name, and uh, proceed to a vote. And there are no further hands that have gone up, so we are on to the vote, which then is uh, Devlin Gauthier. No. 
Oh, is that? No. That's a no. Griezmann? Aye. Yes. Hegner is um, absent. Uh, uh, Matt, this is on the support, or do you support the motion, or do you recommend not support? I don't support. Uh, Bernie? Kubiak? You're muted, Bernie. I'm sorry, I got to learn to push the little button. Um, I, I support the motion. Uh, Shane? Yes. Okay, I'm going to um, support. And um, Walker? Isha? No. Okay, so the motion. Is um, if I get this this correct now, um, three yes, two no, and um, the resident members one in support and one not in support. Do you right. know how much you have to? Believe that. So I think that we. Uh, have a motion that has been passed. I will write this up and uh, as, as I best I have time to do it and I will send a draft to all of you before sending it on because I um, like to run drafts of difficult discussions by the um, committee before sending it to the council so that there would be a draft that goes forward. With that said, um, can we bring uh, Mandy Jo Haneke into the uh, meeting now? Uh, she is uh, chair of CRC, and we had indicated that one member of CRC would be invited to be present. Um, we can't have more than one member of CRC because of uh, the uh, open meeting law problem that would then ensue. So as soon as Mandy gets brought in, just check to make sure she can hear us. And hi, Mandy. Can you hear? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. So, with that said, um, we are now going switching to the next agenda item, which is um, continued discussion of rental registration bylaw and fee structure that goes with the um, is the next step. And of course, we did hear public comment. Uh, one public comment that was offered was on the subject also. And uh, with that, I'm going to actually start by asking Kathy, who said that um, when I spoke with her as vice chair yesterday, that she was going to give some thought to a series of additional questions. And I have not had a chance to go through the draft that you sent to me earlier today. I have to admit that I've been sort of flat out all day. Um, but um, would you are are you in a position to share that with the committee? So with the questions that you identified, and then uh, Rob Moore, are you here? Okay, uh, because Sorry. Rob might be a very important part of answer, of responding to questions as well as uh, um, Mandy. So um, why don't you proceed? I'd be happy to, Andy. And I, um, if I, I held off having Athena send it out or post it because I'm supposed to speak to it first. Um, and there, you don't have to apologize for not having read it. I think I sent it to you 45 minutes before the meeting, which, uh, and it's five pages long. So you wouldn't have it. But what I'll try to do is just focus on the overall um, concepts that I was wrestling with as I'm reading um, the document that clearly a lot of work and a lot of thought went into. And I want to preface it with, um, are there ways that we can think of designing both the permit structure, the frequency you pay a premium, a permit fee, 
and the inspection on how often we do them and if it's in a 50 unit apartment building, 20 apartment building, do we really need to do all of them, even if we're only doing a share of them each of five years? Can't we just do one sample and then do it? Because if we can devise a more targeted approach, um, once we get our baseline, we should hopefully know what 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 we have is, I'll use the word problem po properties. So I don't know what better word to use for them. Um, and so I wanted, I went through a series of what if we did the following, for example, properties that are owner occupied or local, where we've already set up a free schedule that they get a lower fee, could they get a multi-year permit? So, so they could get a three a permit that was good for three years or good for five years. If they had code violations, you know, they were found to be fine when we first inspected them and they get a clean bill of health on the other things that the, the permit law is looking at, you know, complaints, nuisances. So could we do a longer period for the permit um, and on the inspections, could we, um, instead of inspecting all the units within a multi-unit over a five-year period, either all at once or staggered, could we say, we're just going to take one random sample and we're going to be focusing in the 50-unit, 100-unit buildings on the systems? Are the elevators working? Is the plumbing working? Is the electrical, since it's, it's doing all rather than we've got some apartment buildings with tiny efficiencies in them. And the idea that our inspectors are going to go into every one of those over a five-year period doesn't make any sense to me. It feels like overkill. If um, So can we, can we do more targeted once we start um, um, with, I don't know what the right threshold is. Um, so the, all of my questions were... Um, trying to use the estimates we already got on how much money we raise um, from this permit structure, from this inspection structure, if we're billing them, um, but trying to bring down the cost to the well-managed uh, code compliant substantially um, by Redu reducing the frequency. So I tried to start making a table. Mandy, you, you you at CRC gave us these nice tables. So I started to say, okay, if I'm an owner occupied on option one permit fee, I would pay 50 bucks for the permit. Then I would pay 150 for the inspection base. And if I had three of them, 75. So that's where it starts to add up if every single one of them. If that's an entry threshold, and then in the future, if I don't get seen again until five years from now, and I would even on some of them go out 10 years. So I'm, I'm looking at a way, can we focus on where the problem is rather than set up a huge bureaucracy? And then on the flip side, um, I think we have a vacancy in our inspector, our very skilled inspector who retired. I'm not sure we can hire a lot of skilled inspectors. So I also was wondering, Bernie, you and I both started thinking about this last time, that the first year or the first 12 months or 18 months is the biggie because we're trying to get a baseline. Can we contract for services during that year so that we get a better sense of what steady state is? So maybe we only need one and a half inspectors over time once we know what we're, what we're looking at rather than staff up of permanent jobs. So that's, you know, looking for a way of being smart on, on the uh, transition to steady state where we don't know what we're going to find on the first round. So it goes for, on for four, five pages because I tried to think through some different variations on this um, and then interact it with the list of what are we talking about? The and I thank you for the tables because we've got a huge proportion of our units, not the dwellings, in the really big buildings. If you do 20 or more, or 50 or more, you're getting most of the rental units. But I think our problems are in what used to be single family homes or duplexes that have absentee landlords um, and aren't always well managed. Um, so they're old homes that are that are dilapidated. Many of us can point them out. So I was trying to think of both how the inspections get focused 
rather than send our inspectors into the beacon up here and or the big ones downtown or name the others that have been built recently in every unit. Then a tiny piece is I noticed that we didn't exempt the federally inspected um, subsidized units. We give the inspector the option to exempt them. And I would just exempt them. I see no reason of sending our inspectors into places that are being inspected. So I move it up. This is in the bylaw. It's as a, here's the list of exemptions. And down below, it has a possible exemption that Rob could exempt them if he felt like it. But I, I want to limit the number of exemptions and make the permit term potentially be longer. Um, and, and that's where I'll stop because I'm really worried that we create a top heavy, we, we create a bureaucracy and make it really difficult for um, good property managers uh, with long-term tenants to operate in the town of Amherst. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to work on health and safety issues that we know are out there in dilapidated buildings. So all of my five pages that I will share with everybody have to do with better targeting. Um, and I think a lot of this is in the regulations rather than in the bylaw, but some of it might be the wording of the bylaw because the regs talk about frequency and who gets a pass. There's one final one that I don't quite understand what it is, but if there's a complaint, you get a complaint inspection where if it's a landlord tenant dispute and you get a complaint, you're, you're paying 300 bucks for that inspection. And what if it is literally um, you're at loggerheads about something, but it's not a code violation. And what if we get a lot of those? So I'm worried that we've set ourselves up for a lot of appeals and court actions against us on some, on some of these pieces. So that's why I wanted to be more focused. And I will stop there. And if Athena, if you think I've summarized the five pages well enough, I'm happy to send them to everyone and then have, um, and I didn't expect Rob, you to have answers to my, how we might focus it better, but these are the concepts and I suggest some ways to do it. So I um, had to read through a lot of these documents and cross look before I could figure out what it was that, um, was bothering me because I certainly think we, we should be going after the properties that are dangerous. Um, and I agree with that basic concept. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, Kathy, if you can first send that to Robert, Robert, I don't, I don't just... think I... Pardon, Athena? Kathy if, you... Kathy, if you'd please send that to me, I can post it in the packet so it's available for the committee members and members of the public. Okay, I think I sent it to you when I sent it to Andy, but I'll resend it. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know if uh, Rob or Mandy have any initial um, comments that you want to make, your responses, and uh, then we'll go, Rob, since your hand is up. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just a couple. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, so everybody knows that in the larger apartment buildings, we do actually inspect the common areas, major systems already. That's a program that's been in existence required by the building code uh, for as long as I've been doing this type of work. And we do that every other year currently. And that's car, called our COI, Certificate of Inspection Program. What this is, this bylaw is doing is moving that to looking inside the dwelling unit itself. Uh, so just that's a big difference in the type of inspection. Obviously there'd be overlap and they would be done at the same times depending on the cycle, uh, but um, that part of the inspection already occurs. Um, the, the question about why, why staff up, why not contract out? I think the CRC and, and you know, I've certainly participated in this conversation a couple of times uh, and, and we thought about that. Um, it isn't, you know, it, it's, it may be difficult to find a firm that would be able to offer um, inspections of health, fire, building uh, compliance inspections, as well as zoning, uh, which is a really important part for us to deal with. Uh, and it and it isn't, you know, most of the work is really what happens after the inspection. 
So we spend the hour, you know, collecting the information and hopefully a small percentage of those uh, units have issues that we're dealing with. Uh, only a small portion of those have issues, but that, that's what takes the time. It's, it's the several follow-up, the, the email, the, the citation of the, the proper code or regulation. Uh, and that can only be done by, you know, a certified inspector that's appointed by the community. So we can't have an outside service be, you know, the building inspector and cite the building code. So we, ha we have to do that. And same thing for zoning. Um, so after, you know, we talked that through, we felt it made sense. Really, the only way to truly do this and understand the condition of the properties and what is out there for, you know, unit count, bedroom count, compliance with zoning is to do the inspections ourselves uh, because we know all of our rules and regulations that we deal with. And absolutely, you know, the future, hopefully the program downsizes and there's fewer inspections needed and, and the targeting occurs. But I, I would suggest that targeting occurs the second round. Uh, and not not during the first five years when we get to see all the properties. Um, I have mentioned a couple of times in these meetings that I was expecting only to uh, really look at a percentage of the properties in the larger apartment complexes. I realized the reg the draft regulations don't say that. It's it's offered as a possibility in the bylaw, but the regulations as are currently writ written do say that the intent is to have every unit. Um, inspected over that five-year period. I think we need to look at that, uh, you know, after thinking that through, and you'll see in my draft uh, um, fee schedule that I worked on with Sean a few weeks ago, it only accounts for that. It's not accounting for the full 20% uh, of the residential units. So the idea, I think, most recently is that our bylaw, could, our regulations could uh, you know, make that possible that we're not looking at every unit. I don't think we'll need to in every case. Um, the, uh, the last piece I just wanted to mention about the, uh, the, the subsidized housing uh, uh, units, uh, there's about 220 units or so in town. We know um, the intent there is probably not to inspect those. Um, but I will say, and the reason why we left that open is that we have had issues. We've had disagreements with the, uh, the, the Section 8 housing inspectors through the housing authorities and their outside services. Um, it doesn't address zoning. It doesn't address some of the you know, unique situations that our health inspector here can deal with uh, necessarily. So um, there are cases uh, and there's a small number that we are involved in that are uh, units that are inspected by uh, those agencies. And although we'd expect to exempt almost all of them every year, if we needed to, for some reason, require an inspection, we wanted to have that opportunity to do that. Um, and this is, you know, those are cases where it is entirely for the benefit of the occupant of the unit and nothing else. Thank you. Andy, did you just have something? I just want to ask a question on definition. When you said inspection for zoning, is that since the building is okay, is it that is that the number of occupants? Is that what you're looking for in you know a zoning violation? Is what you said. What is that? Yeah, it could be. Uh, you know, about half of our our complaint response matters are zoning related, and half are related to code, some type of code, um, and you know. A lot of those complaint response matters are around parking, occupancy, uh, so uh, unregistered or, or trash of some sort, um, abandoned vehicles. That that's kind of the day-to-day -day zoning piece. But what we uh, throughout the year when we're uh, entering these properties for the first time, uh, I think I've mentioned that we we too often find more dwelling, more bedrooms, more units even in the building than we have his, our record of. Uh, and our assessor's records might call for, say that there's five bedrooms in the building and then we find out there's actually eight. Uh, and then there might be a basement that got converted into a dwelling unit or an attic converted into a dwelling unit over time. And these are things we never knew about, had no record of. Uh, and this is really the time, this is the way we're going to get a good handle on that 
and, and understand what's there, what's permitted according to their either CBA permit or maybe it's pre-existing condition and what needs to be uh, permitted by uh, the Board of Appeals or maybe just not allowed at all uh, and, and the unit removed. So though that's the kind of the harder zoning piece uh, that we run into as we enter these properties uh, for the first time. Okay. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, um, thank you, Rob, for going over a number of the things that CRC's heard and discussed um, all the time with that. I, I wanted to um, say two things. The, the Excel spreadsheet that was included in that, in case there is confusion, the has has multiple tabs and the tab on rate uh permit application fees was a tab that includes dollars and and costs that CRC said they think is logical but finance should really be the one looking at it the tab that talks about inspection fees is completely not a proposal that CRC is sending to finance to review and all. It is just something that is there as an example of other than the different inspections and the numbers in it are just a, here's some options on how you might get to the final dollar amount that we might be aiming for. CRC made no recommendation as to that is a good proposal or not. And I just wanna make sure that the finance members know that those numbers do not come with any particular, the numbers do not come with any particular recommendation as it relates to the inspection fees. Um, and I think I was, I, I tried to be clear on that in the supplemental memo that CRC sent to the council. Um, and the other thing I would say is I think what would be most helpful to the council and CRC for finances discussion is a couple of things. The first is to determine the dollar amount that the town is seeking to receive in revenue directly from the program versus to, to use from operating budget, uh, pilot amounts, um, other fees, in other words, if Rob has estimated that the program will take $500,000, do the revenues from inspections and permit fees need to equal $500,000 or is there another number finance would recommend the revenues equal from the permit and uh, inspection fees? That would be a very helpful discussion for the council overall to have because that was one thing that CRC struggled with and why we thought finance should be involved in that. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, if finance believes the program itself is too expensive, I would urge finance to not necessarily come in with specific, well, reduce it to, you know, increase something to three years or increase something to 10 years or something like that. Just tell us it's expensive and how much you're aiming for and maybe some suggestions, but CRC has a background of knowledge after 15 months of discussions that finance will never be able to match in three months in terms of all of the nuances of the trade-offs between increasing the inspection, the application and permits from one year to two years to three years or not for which ones to do that. And, and same with the frequency of inspections. So I would just encourage you if, if you do believe that the program as proposed is too expensive to indicate broad areas where, but you know, th this is me as chair, leave the nitty gritty of how to reduce it specifically to CRC where all that background and conversation already exists and can probably be done more efficiency, efficiently than in a committee that hasn't been discussing it for 15 years. And, and we will take all of the recommendations seriously, but I, that's just my, thoughts from as a chair of CRC in terms of efficiency purposes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to say one thing in response to what you just said for the benefit of the committee. Um, I think that I had offered to give the uh, Excel spreadsheet version of what was also presented 
as a PDF and uh, to anybody who requested it. But um, I'm going to add it to the packet for this meeting so that it's available for everybody to look at. And, uh, and uh, uh, then you can uh, be able to look at the tabs that uh, Mandy was referring to, because I think that they were not available looking at the uh, version that was in the uh, PDF document that you did receive. Um, it will make it, however, Mandy, a public document at that point when it goes into the packet to see it uh, is an obvious point because uh, we can't do it any other way. Um, I put my hand in line because I have the questions, but I'm holding, I'm going in order that hands went up. So, Bernie. Thank you, Andy. Um, let me just start by saying I have a great deal of sympathy for Rob and uh, the uh, the work that he's asked to do. Uh, it's it's not um, it's not easy. Um, now let me get my screen back here so I can see myself. There we go. Uh, that said, I think we need to, um, and without being terribly prescriptive, I think we need to take a. Uh, Q from our uh, uh, Massachusetts resident, former resident, uh, Henry David Thoreau, and simplify, simplify. Uh, I think the program is it's is it, it's outlined is uh, is is comprehensive, but maybe too so for uh, uh, given the situation that we find ourselves in, both fiscally and in terms of the field. Uh, I don't know if life has changed. I haven't looked at it. Uh, the situation in, in about a year and a half, but people who are skilled inspectors, especially people who could do the building and building stuff combined with the zoning enforcement piece are few and far between. Uh, they're hard to recruit. And to try and recruit somebody in on a, a temporary basis uh, could be more trouble, uh, trouble than, it's, than it's worth. So uh, the other thing that I would say, the other thing that I would look at is, is the program should cover its costs. It deals with an externality. It deals with people making uh, uh, money off uh, property rentals. And some of those people are bad actors. Um, some of those tenants are not the best tenants. And they generate a cost for the community that the community should not bear. It's the property owner should cover it. So um, if you scale back the program and make it more specific, maybe make it more complaint driven, um, you, you can lean more heavily on the uh, the people who are not interested in providing quality housing. Uh, and, and, you know, those are those be general guidelines. The other thing I'd like to know is, has uh, the town attorney um, told us that it's okay to give a discount to people who have rental properties who live in town, as opposed to um, people or corporations uh, who don't live here or aren't, aren't headquartered here? Um, it seems to me on the face of it that that's asking for a lawsuit. Uh, and I will be the first to say we should never not do something because we might get sued. Uh, but I would be help. It would be more helpful if we heard from uh, town attorney that that's that's okay. So there's a, there's my scaled back version that didn't get down into the weeds and tell you to do things in three days instead of five or five months instead of uh, twenty seven. Um, which, by the way, I think would be fair discussion for this committee if the people want to uh, want to engage in it. Uh, um, but I do understand that uh, you you acquire a certain amount of, of insight and expertise when you spend a lot of time studying it, which um, I dare say I, none of us have. Um, so that's that's my two cents. Yeah, uh, Mandy, let me uh, follow up on that with one question, then get to Alicia. Uh, the point that Bernie was making about whether there's a litigation risk and um, the prior discussion had been, as I recall, as I thought I understood it, that it was um, owner occupancy that was the trigger um, and not a an owner who lives in town. We've got, they have both in their fee schedule. So I, I can say KP Law has reviewed the regulations in the bylaw. It has not reviewed the draft schedule. 
um, or the, and the schedule, the draft schedule that includes those those delineations. And the current draft schedule does include three different categories for um, application fees: one for owner occupied dwellings, one mm -hmm. for um, dwellings who have an owner living in town. Um, for parcels that are rented that have an owner that lives in town um, who is seeking permits for three or fewer, um, I think it's rental units. Um, so that could be three parcels with one rental unit on it each or one parcel with three rental units on it each, but live in town. Um, and then the third delineation is everyone else. Um, it has not been, KP Law has not seen the draft schedule that has those delineations in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alicia. Um, thank you, Andy. I had some very similar concerns to Bernie, so I won't repeat those, but I just have a question for Manny Joe. I'm hoping you can remind me um, what like issue or challenge or series of issues and challenges you were looking to address with this bylaw. And then also when you were in the planning stage, was there ever any intention of this being revenue generating? If I may, Andy? Yes, please. So, so the main item that CRC was tasked with and, and its main goal in this revision, although there are some secondary goals, the very biggest goal is to have town inspectors have the ability to inspect our rental properties in town, um, not on just a complaint basis. Right now, the inspect the permit program is a self inspection by the a self certification by the property owner that the property complies with all building code and zoning and health regulations. And if you, uh, Rob can address this. I know John Thompson has. We've actually heard from in our surveys, actual tenants that those self certifications come in on July 1 with everything matches and everything complies and parents will move their students in on July 15 or August 1 and call the town and the town will go out and will find many numbers of violations that are clear that they have existed for more than 30 days. But unless the town receives a complaint, they cannot go into any property. Um, and so the inspection services department through Rob has been um, vocal at CRC that they would like the ability to inspect our rental units for health and safety matters to, to get them up to code, not on just a complaint basis. And so that was the biggest sort of impetus for this change and why you see the inspection portion of this for the application. Um, in the revenue generation, when we started this process from council referral a year and a half ago, uh, CRC was, it, it was implied to CRC that the program should be revenue neutral. So not necessarily revenue generating, meaning the program should cover through its fees, its own costs. Um, what CRC began struggling with when it started looking at how to do that based on the program it was drafting and talking about was, is that still logical? We know there's some pilot money that was just agreed to that is meant for health and safety of students in and student um, of, of properties in town. Uh, I, I don't know how it's worded, um, but a yearly part of the pilot is, is um, indicated for not necessarily this program, but other things. And we also heard from a number of residents, including tenants and including property owners that this program will benefit not just the people living in the properties, that it's a benefit to all taxpayers in town and therefore some costs of the program should be borne by all taxpayers. And so when we started hearing those comments, CRC did not believe it was um, it was its place as a committee uh, to discuss 
those specific issues and then should it be revenue neutral or revenue loss because some costs will be covered by all operating budgets that are not part of these fees or not and that's where we started thinking finance was the better place for those discussions and i think that uh, it's important to note that uh state uh department of revenue uh, regulations and uh, state law specify that fees should only cover the costs that are being um, absorbed by the payment of the fee and uh, that it's not permitted to use fees as a revenue generation for other purposes um my uh, question, the reason I have my hand up, Rob, is that uh, when I've talked to John Thompson uh, a few times over the years about this, he indicated that at the time of those conversations, that a significant portion of his time, but he never said what significant was, uh, was just trying to make sure that all rental property is actually going through the rental registration process and that when uh, he was alerted to a rental uh, that was not in the inspection program uh, that it took some time um, depending upon uh, the circumstances to find um, the owner of the property and to actually enforce the rental registration and require rental registration. Uh, is that still a significant portion of time that um, employees of your department have? Can you give us an idea of the amount? And, you know, I think then we get into the question of whether, um, wh where those expenses should um, come in. Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's there's two different um, kind of situations that we deal with. The ones where, you know, a complaint may be generated from a, a, an abutting property, uh, brings an inspector to the property or the neighborhood and finds that there's a property that's not registered. And I think that's probably what John has was talking about, that type of situation. And uh, it's that's absolutely correct that it takes a lot of time. To, to sort through that and get a uh, response once we uh, find who the owner is. Often properties are, you know, held in LLCs or whatever the case may be. It's not always straightforward to get in touch with somebody from out of town. Um, you know, one of the successes of this program that we have now is that it, it established who, for the record, who owns a property and the way to get in touch with them for the properties that are actually following the rules. So that, you know, that has been great. Um, so the other piece of that is, uh, and this is something that we haven't been able to keep up on year to year, but we did put a major effort into it last year, is to really search town records, look at assessing records, uh, ownership records, and try to identify those properties that look like they may need to be in the program, but aren't. And, you know, we did that. Uh, it takes several months uh, of a couple of staff really staying on that, uh, making phone calls, sending notices. Uh, that that effort last year, I think if I'm right, it's somewhere around 120 to 150 property, you know, new permits that were uh, put into the program uh, as a result of that effort. So that's something, like I said, John, you know, couldn't possibly have done year to year on his own. He, you know, uh, but uh, with a couple other uh, staff uh, assigned to help with that effort, uh, we were able to get that done over a three to four month period. And that was that was generated out of some of the discussion with the CRC developing this this draft bylaw and some of the questions that they had. Um, you know, really kind of sparked our interest in doing that and being able to report on that and. Uh, uh, our sense is that uh, year to year, that's probably something that's going to have to be done to make sure that properties stay in the program. And, you know, it, it's really difficult without uh, a, a, a fuller staff to be able to do that uh, in addition to the day to day things and be consistent with it, which is really the, the harder part of it. Uh, and now would be an ideal time for us. You know, we just came through a renewal. 
uh, now we're looking at the properties that uh, didn't renew for that were in the program last year. That's those are the easiest ones to identify. And then we, you know, we go from there. Thank you. Um, we will need to come back to that question that I raised as a second point, and that is whether uh, inspection and registration fees of compliant properties should be paying that expense or where that um, otherwise, how that is being funded. Um, but Lynn, your hand is up. Thanks, Andy. Um, and Mandy Joe, I want to thank you for although it's in your memos and so forth, for clarifying what you seek from finance versus what we should go back and say to CRC, okay? And the fact that you've spent 15 months and you're right, I'm not an expert on rental registration. Just trying to look at how the town can ensure better rentals in our community that are safe for all residents, whether they're mm -hmm. students or not students, okay? I strongly believe that this cannot be totally supported by town budget, that somehow or another, the use of fees for the purpose that the fees were collected, going back to Andy's point, need to go into a fund that is used for that purpose, okay? Whether that's an enterprise fund or what it is, it needs to go into it. I also really want the town to move from complaint basis to actual, uh, more of the kind of inspection we're talking about. But I got a little concerned, Rob, when you talked about the first five years versus after that, because it almost sounds like we're gonna spend the first five years taking inventory of the stock. And that's a big, that's a big job, okay? And and how are we gonna fund that job if, because I, I'm also hearing, and I am hearing from residents who are actually fine landlords, they manage excellent properties, they might have four or five around town, and they're looking at this and saying, I'm not the problem. So I I want to try to make sure we're not, quote, suggesting all owners of properties are slumlords. They're not. We have some outstandingly good owners of properties in town. So this is a big puzzle. And it's a puzzle of how do we want to do this so that it's legal that the fees are legal so that we protect the safety of our residents and at the same time, respect responsible landlords. And, and how are we going to do this when we can't even hire somebody to replace our existing building inspector because we aren't paying at the level other places for. So I do want to suggest that instead of thinking, is there a company are there individuals who we can contract with for 30 or 40% of their time because they actually would like to do some extra work? And, but they have benefits coming in from elsewhere. And I know managing a part time uh, workforce is difficult, but sometimes in this work environment, we just have to look at it creative. Um, and then my final question questions are really around when a property owner sells and a new property owner comes in, will the inspection records of the property be made available prior to the sell of the property? Because in many cases, you know, you go to buy a home and we all bring, we bring in an inspector, or at least we should, we bring in an inspector who inspects the home for us and says, you know, this is fine, but I got to tell you, the boiler is 25 years old. So you buy that property with your eyes open. The town is going to now have significant data about a property that if I were buying a rental property, I'm not, thank you very much, been there, done that, don't want to do it again. If I were buying a rental property, 
I would want to have access to those records as part of my purchase and sale. And so it's a matter of what is public and what isn't public. So that's a lot all at once. I, I really want to hope that we can find a solution to this that works for the town and works for our property owners and helps clean up the properties that need to get cleaned up. That's my bottom line. Thanks. Uh, Rod? Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple things. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, we do have some part-time uh, employees that work for the town conducting inspections. Uh, I found that's even harder to find people interested in doing that kind of work. And, um, you know, as far as being competitive with pay, the, the part-time scale is probably even more discouraging than our full-time scale. Uh, so I've been, I have been through that for years and we, we often struggle with that as well uh, and talked about that uh, at length uh, also. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, uh, to, to mention that. So I'm aware of that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Matt. Thank, thanks, Andy, and thank you, Mandy, Joe, and Rob, and um, and all have been working on this. I, so, I guess I have a couple of questions and, and a couple of comments. Um, I I agree with the running um, concern around staffing. You know, Rob, you and I spoke a little bit about about this a while ago, and it's it's. I guess I I, I live in a world where you know we oftentimes conceive of the perfect position and then the perfect scheme of staff to, to do things that we want to do. And really it just, so much of this does become personnel dependent in terms of how it really runs. So uh, I think that I, I think that I agree with the idea of contracting or consulting in, um, especially for some of the ramp up costs, you know, in those first couple of years, as, as Kathy said, you know, figuring out what our baseline looks like um, I, I, and, and identifying housing stock, all, all those things I think are really um, well put, you know, and, and I think it's just the reality that if all of this passed, uh, the council, you know, implementation would would still be delayed until we, you know, fill key, some key spots. So I, I, I um, you know, I, I empathize, I support you in that. And I, I think um, it is, it's kind of hard to even conceptualize a full scheme without, you know, that, your, that chief inspector um, in place. Uh, Rob, I really appreciated your comment about subsidized housing and the inspections there. Um, you know, and, and doing it entirely for the benefit of the occupant, I think that's that's well put. I've I've definitely been hearing a lot of folks who are talking about you know low quality uh, apartments that you know I mean college students was the example I was getting, but I think that that crosses across all different spectra. You know, um, so I I really appreciate and I, and that that ethos I think is is something that um, should be communicated really clearly to the community because. Um, sometimes this it does feel like there's a there's a animosity between renters and owners in town, and I think you, you know that 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 service that spirit of kind of serving the renter I think is something that um, gets lost on folks, and I think that you know it, it's a it's a conceptual thing, and I realize this isn't a, a financial point, Manny Joe, but I, I just want to address some of my thoughts here. Um, and and so you know I appreciate that and then at the same time and and I've spoken to Manny Joe and others about this you know I I am concerned that you know anytime we increase the cost on landlords there is uh, that is in don't take it the wrong way that's an excuse right I mean that that pass through to raise the rent it, you know is an excuse and and I'm not saying that our landlords are are out there doing that willy nilly but I think that is a that's a real a reality right that that you know whatever cost we apply to to landlords will get pass along to the, to the renter. And, and so, um, <laughs> okay, actually I will take your, uh, your advice to Manny Joe, and I'll, I'll say, I'll pass that back to CRC and say, you know, um, solutions on that particular issue, I think are probably the most pressing for me in terms of what, you know, what impact this bylaw might have. Um, I hear the, I hear the thought that, you know, we don't want to be complaint driven all the time and reactive, but Rob, I, I, I was under the impression that, um, at least talking to John, that, that, you know, your inspectors could, essentially make their own complaint if they had just reason to, you know, if they wanted to see a property because they had, you know, probable, quote unquote, probable cause to go do an inspect, they could, they could make their own complaint. I realize that's a um, customer service issue and, and you really want to avoid, you know, the, the appearance of imp impropriety or not imp impropriety, but the appearance of bias. But, but I was under the impression that your folks could make, could make their own complaints and, and investigate according to that. Um, 
And I probably had a few more thoughts, but that's a lot. So I'm just going to pass. Thanks. So Rob. Yeah, so on that, that last point there about our own complaints, um, the bylaw, the current bylaw does allow us to do that, certainly. Um, it's it, it happens uh, from time to time when, uh, and it's, you know, when John res was responding to something and maybe came across something close by uh, that was in very clear view and visible and he would, you know, make contact to the, the, to the property owner of that particular rental and, and deal with it. I think what we've asked for as part of kind of the overall, you know, enhancement of this program is to have, be able to dedicate time to some proactive enforcement, uh, whether that's between inspections or, you know, when we get into this, maybe it's not until after that five-year cycle that we actually have time to do that. But there is, there is no proactive enforcement. So the, the program now is really complaint response on those few occasions where an inspector on their way to work sees something really offensive, they'll deal with it. Uh, they won't ignore it. So, uh, but that's, that's pretty limited in the number of responses or the volume of work that John had done over the years. Um, while I'm talking, I just wanted to go back quickly to one of Lynn's comments that I, that I intended to answer was about the public display of this information. Uh, we use a program called OpenGov for our permitting now. We are slowly transitioning all of our, our, um, our licenses and permits into it. It's been fabulous. Uh, right now, you can see the permit displayed on a property that's publicly available to view. Uh, and that's where the inspection report would live. So that would be available in the system we have uh, already established that will continue and enhance over time. And for anyone that's interested, Burlington, Vermont uses the same program and uses those functions. So if you were to go there and be able to find a rental property and they have a map that you can hover over and find all the rental properties, select one, you could see an example of a type of inspection report that they use. And just as an, you know, an idea that that's how, you know, they're not the same documents, obviously, but, you know, that's how it could work uh, and probably even better uh, over time as we build out that system. Thank you. Andy, uh, trying to keep coming back to you and Rob as uh, we respond to. Yeah, no, thank you. And and sorry, I had to step away for a little bit. Um, So I missed a lot of Lynn's specific comments, but got the general gist of them. So, um, but for Matt, um, when you talk about the solutions to how to pass the, the, the issue of if we do this program and the costs go up and it will get passed on and, and we already have high tenant costs. We heard a lot about that. It's one of the reasons I think CRC struggled with how to set the fees and why we recommended you guys talk about it. <laughs> because you know you, you said, mm -hmm. well, it's not really a finance issue, but it kind of is, right? Does this program, do the fees cover 100% of the program or should the fees cover only 50% of the program with general revenues from property taxes in general covering the rest? And I just throw out the 50% just, but that, in some sense, that's the struggle of the question. CRC in the end said, that's not our decision to make or make a recommendation on because that's more within the purview of finance and financial and all of that. Um, but it was one of our top struggles in terms of how to minimize the costs, recognizing that even though the bylaw itself prohibits the complaint inspection fees from being passed on to tenants, um, that's if, if there's an actual complaint that says there's a violation, a, a landlord would not be able to pass that on to tenants. It it does not, and may, it may not be appropriate to, I don't know, pat, prohibit the passing on of the application fee or the required inspection fee just to get the permit. And so CRC basically assumed a lot of that would be folded into um, annual rents, which might increase annual rents. It who knows by how much and that was a big concern and a lot of discussion and it's why we passed it on to you guys <laughs> yeah and andy if i may i just I, that wasn't the part that i was that i said the, the personnel issue is not a finance issue i i fully agree the fee structure is a finance issue yeah um 
Let me try to organize my thoughts because Bernie was a lot more eloquent than I was where I jumped into the weeds right away. But the notion of simplifying was where I was starting from. And I will, Mandy, I know you all spent 15 months, but I'm perfectly willing to jump into um, examples. So if Burlington has an example of a place that is permitting and inspecting, I'm looking for places that do it in a focused, targeted, efficient way. And what I'm reading in the text and the regulations is I don't see it. Um, and so my questions were less on let's do this or let's do that mm -hmm. and more how are these ways we could pare it down to make it less onerous on places that we think are not a problem at all? Um, and if we don't know they're not a problem on day one, if we know it two months from now, we give them a longer free pass before we come back to them. Um, and and they, we have enough, this is an industry in town, you know, a big one um, in terms of people uh, making extra money off of it that aren't that are our residents, not just out of town. And we know uh, you use the term bad apple, uh, Bernie, and we know they're dilapidated properties. We know from the look of the outside of them, we're wondering what's inside them. <laughs> um, and until you get inside them, you won't know. So I don't disagree with the thrust of this, but I think um, the trying to make the fees match the expected costs. Yes, that's what was thrown to us, but the costs reflect how often we're doing each thing. I mean, Rob gave us um, an example where he said the reg version says go to every apartment within a big building at least once in the five years. But as I heard you say, Rob, you'd be okay with a sample rather than trying to hit every single one of them. Because just as you can, you know a lot when you get inside some of these buildings and you don't have to hit all 50 efficiencies, whether it's the first year. So that's an example of the number of many fewer inspections because we have a huge, I mean, the, the table you gave, we have a lot of rental units in these big buildings. It's a huge share of the total. And if we don't have to go to every single one of them, um, it saves money on inspection time. Um, then the other thought I had, Rob, was less on a um, going to an outside company or even just a part-time staff. But um, what I've seen, and who knows whether this exists in the inspector word, if you're setting up a project that we want someone who's interested in coming and working with us for two years, with this many hours, you could pull a retiree in who might want to do it. They're not looking for a long-term part-time job, but it's a focus. So you see it on faculty. I'm willing to come teach one course for one semester or two semesters. So trying to think of how do you do that transition piece to get out and um, get inside the doors of, of buildings. Um, and so that was where I was thinking of what do you do in the year one-ish um, on whether you think, because this is tied, you don't get a permit unless you have an inspection and you have this contingent permis, permitting um, doing, but I'm thinking we really don't want to delay giving a permit to people that have 15 year tenants in their property. And we don't think there's a problem with them. We want to get in and out really fast and say, good place. Thank you very much. So there's a concern that they wouldn't even have a, you know, so, so that speed of doing it. So I don't have a solution for it, but I'm just trying to say if we can't hire a full-time person easily, we found in part-time, are there, um, if I know it's it's a two-year gig with a limited number of hours and it plays to my skill set, or there's some people sitting out there that would come out of retirement. You find this with nurses all the time, really good ones that just didn't want to be committing for long term. So those are ideas. Um, and I did not um, go through, there's a lot of pages to read here. When Bernie said simplify, I didn't go through the pages of the bylaw and the pages of the reg to say, where could I see literally simplify? Um, and I, because I was trying to focus just on the things that I thought cost money, you know, number of times I touch a property, 
person goes out more times, costs money. Um, complicated application processes are costing staff money and costing landlord money. So the what information an applicant has to give, um, and I'll look at our permitting now, are we asking for things that are really easy to fill out? And is year two a nothing's changed, um, you know, kind of a list, you know, I'm still the same person I was or the same property. And if it's nothing changed, the ownership didn't change, could we make the permit a five-year permit or three-year permit? Those are questions I'm raising rather than let's do it. Um, but every time you make people re-upload information or staff recheck it, um, it's it's somebody's labor time. So I'm looking for ways to lower the labor costs on the two sides of the equation, the receiving end and the town end, to make implementation a success rather than um, have everyone screaming at us that you know um, they're they're in my house. And I'm a renter and I have a great house and I don't want them to be here right now, you know, on a, you know, I have children, you know, so just trying to think through the mechanics of it. So, um, and then my last is Lynn has said more than once, because you said it last time, Lynn, on do we need to set up a protected fund? As far as I can see, the fees we're getting right now for permits when we went up are probably generating more revenue than the costs of, of running the program based on. And so I'm assuming that just at the end of the year, you didn't spend everything you took in and the excess fees are going over to support the general budget. And we want, we certainly want to avoid doing that over time. You know, it might be a startup, but we didn't fine tune it enough. And Lynn, you were suggesting a way to keep the fees internal. And if we're running surpluses, you lower the fees then, you know, they're, they've not been set correctly. Um, but I don't know, Lynn, on whether there's any way to do that other than an enterprise fund. So that's just a question on, is there a way of, of sequestering these funds or for this purpose? And um, they go to partially fund the following year if we didn't use them all. Um, so that is a question I didn't have in my long document. So I I, th I think you work work long and hard on it, but it 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 reads like a very intense, uh, very labor intensive process to try to find the problem houses. And so I'm looking at problem properties. So I'm looking for a way of simplifying it and targeting. And I will look at a couple places that I think face our concerns, like Burlington. And I'm perfectly willing to do that on my own time. You may already have looked at all of them, but I just want to look at, do we have any examples of people doing it really efficiently where the landlords don't care, the renter don't mind. They think it's a fair process. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy, I have a text from Alicia at 251 that said she had lost her connection and it had failed for some reason, and she needed to leave by three. So we need to note on the record at 2.51, she left the meeting. And she did have some comments, and she will send them um, to Mandy Jo. Okay? Thank you. Okay. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I would ask that she send them to the committee, too. Uh, and I can uh, text her later and acknowledge what happened and take care of that request um please don't ask her to send comments to the whole committee andy please don't ask her to send comments to the whole thing um i didn't hear you exactly please don't ask alicia to send her comments to the whole committee uh, what, what athena is saying yeah. please don't yeah. ask yeah. alicia to send, send her comments to the whole committee for open meeting law purposes Alicia, I mean, Athena, where do you want them sent? I, I, I think the point is, if I get this correctly, is that uh, we offer Alicia the opportunity, if she wishes, to share the comments she intended to make before she lost her connection, but that if she does so, they have to go to the entire committee and become a part of the record. No, she should not share her comments with the entire committee outside a meeting. She should not. So she should she hold should up not. the next meeting. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. 
will do. Um, I, we are going to come back to the next meeting actually to try and draw this to a conclusion because uh, I had one other member uh, who indicated uh, that he had a time limit. And Matt just raised his hand to acknowledge it was him. It was uh, so, um, and, and I think on it too. We we recognized that we had two meetings scheduled, one for the uh, for September, and they were the, this Friday and next Friday. Um, the reasons that we were getting into not doing the following Fridays was other things going on, such as the um, uh, cables and uh, the the new housing on uh, to the on Main Street and the open house at that location. And I think that there was a conflict with the next Friday too, if I recall. So, um, but we do want to get back to this next week. My, I was trying to keep track of questions that we need to investigate. One is to see if we can find out um, whether KPU Law has any advice on the issue that I believe it was Bernie who uh, first raised regarding whether uh, we can uh, charge, um, wh whether there's any legal concerns about charging fees that are differential solely on the basis of residents um, of the owner of the property. And uh, if we're going to go the next step to do that, I also had some questions of Holly and uh, the, uh, for, for the next meeting about the some of the accounting questions of how the uh, money, uh, how we keep track of inspection fees and other fees and make sure that the fees are used for the purposes that are intended. What is the basis for doing that? And uh, also uh, how the um, program is currently being supported, um, whether um, it is from fees or partially from the budget. So we know as we go forward, whether a portion of the budget is supporting the um, rental registration program uh, in its current format, and that gets back into the question that I had raised earlier, uh, that John responded, uh, or that Rob responded to so um, thoroughly about um, how we make sure that properties that are rental properties are actually doing the registration and complying with the program. Uh, so I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that we get a response to those at a later time. Lynn, you had something else? Um, Andy, uh, this is something that Athena and I have agreed uh, we're going to be communicating to all chairs, and that is um, by the middle of, by the beginning to the end, middle of November, all chairs need to be deciding what they are going to finish up in this term and what they're not. And so we need to start looking uh, strategically at that. Athena may want to add to that. Uh, Andy, if it's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I spoke with uh, Dave, who's here in the audience, yesterday about the surplus real property disposition policy that the committee had begun looking at earlier this year. And uh, Dave is working on, we're hoping to have a draft for the committee to look at at the next meeting. Um, I'm sorry, the meeting, the second meeting in October, but then looking ahead if the committee is planning two meetings up per month until the end of the year, then we just have seven meetings left. And so, um, like Lynn said, we're going to start to look at scheduling out things and making sure that the committee has enough time on each of its agendas to get the things done that it would like to get done before the end of the year and begin work on those carryover memos for the next council's term. So you and I can can meet and talk about that, but I wanted to say it during the committee meeting so that everyone kind of has a sense of how much time there is left um, before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. And I have been very clear with uh, the committee that we have three major referrals that we're working on right now, the two we discussed today, and the third being the streetlight policy, and that there were dates that were 
incorporated in the council referral motions that I have continued to put forward to the committee in the order in which they came up so that uh, um, the third one is the streetlight policy. Uh, and Mandy is present, so uh, if she has anything to add to this, but I did attend the TSO uh, town, uh, the uh, not TSO meeting, the TAC meeting, Transportation Advisory Committee yesterday, and they had a discussion about the streetlight policy and uh, reported that they were working with uh, Mandy um, as one of the um, sponsors of that particular um, uh, policy on possible modifications, and then it would go back to TSO. So I had not put it on the agenda for this meeting, um, largely because um, I thought we were going to be filled up with these two items um, that we did uh, can't neglect the streetlight policy. But it seemed to make sense uh, from what I was understanding and confirmed yesterday at TAC to uh, at least see what's happening. Mandy, do you have anything to add to that? Um, in talking with Anika yesterday, the current plan, which may change, is to have TSO review um, new revisions to the lighting policy proposal on September 28th and October 12th, if that helps finance schedule stuff. That may change, but that's the current plan. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to make um, finance committee aware that um, this is not one that's being neglected, but if there were changes in the policy that we should, that it was a, a reason to focus on the two that I, put on the agenda today. Uh, I hope that uh, that was an ag agreeable with the rest of the committee. Uh, Athena, did you have something that you want to add? Um, yep, quickly, we will have some financial orders. Sorry, Holly, I'm talking for you. Um, we'll have some financial orders uh, coming late October, early November, certification of free, free cash and transfers of free cash into uh, various funds and maybe an additional financial order just to um, add that to the list of things in front of finance committee that are coming out before the end of the year. Okay. Um, Lynn? Uh, please note that Anna had to leave the meeting. Uh, and also that um, we also have the other really big job, which is guidelines. And so let me just mention in terms of council meetings, uh, the compensation stuff will now go on the agenda for September 18th. And we, uh, at this meeting uh, on Monday, will discuss uh, the town manager um, evaluation and it'll be a quick referral to GOL and hopefully back uh, from GOL. Uh, and then, because we need to get going on it, and also um, don't, on the 18th at this point, uh, we're scheduled to begin to get some of the thoughts about financial guidelines from the counselors. Okay. So I have those on my list for, to finish up. Also, do we have dates for October, November, and December? No, we don't. And um, I think... Probably the best thing to do is for um, me to work with uh, Athena and get a um, propose some dates that work and then uh, get a doodle poll so that we can get input from the committee that way as to who's available. Uh, as far as scheduling is concerned, I think the one thing that I'm always very conscious of is has a date been set for the uh, meeting at which uh, the uh, town manager and finance directors are going to make the presentation about trends and um, the uh, financial projections for the next year? Financial indicators is set for October, I mean, I'm sorry, November 13th. 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 
Thank you. Yep. And uh, the that is also probably the meeting at which we will start dealing with things like, and I hate the word, free cash uh, and other financial orders uh, that we often have to do to kind of mop th things up from the previous year. Um, and uh, any other financial stuff will probably be on that date. I, as we all know, we're trying to squeeze in things around um, the additional work we're doing to try to help the school committee become a quorum again. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, point that out. Uh, I was asking about the uh, indicators meeting because we usually use that as the trigger point for the discussion of the uh, guidelines for the next year because uh, what we propose in guidelines is dependent upon the projections of the money that's available. Um, let me, while we're on it, so the 13th of November, we will discuss, uh, the, that is when we will do the financial indicators. It is when we will invite uh, the school committee and the um, library uh, trustees, et cetera, uh, and have a quote committee of the whole, not committee of the whole, um, BCG meeting. Uh, there may be a BCG meeting earlier than that if we can figure out how to schedule it. And um, then on the 20th of November is when we will have the public forum required for next year's budget. Okay. Maybe. Okay, so um, I think we've covered, uh, I have, um, as far as unanticipated business, uh, Really don't have any that are business because the uh, everything else has been covered pretty much as announcements. So we know the next meeting date. As far as approval of minutes is concerned, I don't know how many people have had the opportunity to look at the four sets of minutes. I tried to do that this morning, but uh, this morning has uh, not been my uh, morning where I had as much time as I had hoped. And uh, the only minutes that I came completed on where the first ones listed is March 28th, and I found no problems with them. I don't know if anybody else has had a chance to look at March 28th. And uh, other... Uh, I'm, I'd like to move that we approve the minutes for March 28th. Okay, and I'll second that so we can just move forward with it. And since we have to take a uh, roll call vote on it, uh, I noticed the. I will note that Anna's absent. Lynn. Aye. Uh, Hegner's absent. Matt. He's left. He's left. So uh, he's absent. Uh, Bernie. I I concur. Okay, uh, Kathy. Yes. And I'm a yes and. Uh, Felicia is also absent. So uh, as far as the next set of minutes, which is uh, I got substantially through them, but not entirely, there were minor corrections that I'm going to have to offer, uh, but they're not major uh, points. And uh, I will get them to you and continue to march along as best we can to continue to get minutes done. Uh, and uh, Athena's uh, going to add four per meeting to, to try and get us on on track to get this done. So that uh, that's why there were four this time. But that's the goal is to add four to the to the list so that we can and try and get them done. Anything else that somebody has to offer? If not, I'm going to declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This is a good meeting.